Welcome everybody to another session of Logics in Quarantena. On behalf of the Brazilian Logic Society and of the Logic Interest Group of the Brazilian Computer Society, it's a pleasure to have you all here. And I would like to, to thank you very much, Professor Damien Smuck, who kindly accepted our invitation to give this talk. Damien, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bruno and Petrucio and everyone in the Brazilian Society. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, have a lot of Brazilian friends like Edson here, but many, many, many others. We're actually right now organizing um, uh, um, a special issue from a, for a very well-known journal, Logical, Logical Philosophy, together with the people in Campinas and Minas Gerais. So if you're interested, check that out. We send the information in the Logic Supergroup, but you can also email me and whatnot. Um, so um, I'll just start. So this is a very... Um, Dear project for me because it um, mixes a lot of topics that I have been working on recently, uh, mainly non transitive logics and also relevant logics, featuring some special um, variable sharing properties. So I have been uh, really interested in, in um, parry logics, so the logic of analytic implication, and also angels logic, and, and, and also some other um, logics in the vicinity. Um, and I have also been interested in uh, non-transitive logics for paradoxes and, and whatnot. And this project sort of uh, allows me to merge these two interests uh, uh, together in one, in one project. So um, what I'm going to study here in this presentation is the fragment of classical logic that respects the variable chain property. So it's just super easy way and super straightforward way to express this is that I'm going to just take classical logic and look for the set of valid inferences of classical logic that actually respect the variable chain property, right? Good. So basically, this is what I'm going for. I'm going to call this CL uh, BSP for classical logic variable chain property, uh, variable chain principle. So basically, the system that I'm going for is the system whose valid inferences here on the left are those which are valid in classical logic, and also, you know, premise and conclusion share some propositional variable, okay? And I'm going propositional here. Hopefully, this can be extended to the um, first order case straightforwardly, okay? And actually, you can think about any logic and its fragment who, which uh, respects the variable chain property. I'm not going to discuss in full generality, my results here, but actually they can be applied. All the tools that I apply here for the case of classical logic can be implemented for any task in logic whatsoever. So it's not restricted to classical logic, although I'm going to discuss that case in particular. Uh, as you see, I'm going to stick with single premise and single conclusion. Um, I don't know whether this can be extended to multiple premises, multiple conclusions. I suspect it cannot, but I don't have a proof. So I'm going to stick to the positive case where I positively have some answer. And this is the case here, single, single. Okay, so why study this system? Uh, so basically, you know, a, a lot of uh, logicians and philosophers uh, discussing uh, relevance have noted that the variable chain principle is not a sufficient but only necessary criteria for relevance. Uh, for example, I was just reading uh, Neil Tennant. We have many, many, many others uh, also writing in that direction. Um, and so, although it might not be sufficient, one question uh, I think that is interesting to ask is whether or not it could be jointly sufficient together with something else. And that something else could be, for example, truth preservation, right? So um, this is one way of looking at why I'm aiming for this fragment of classical logic. And the reason is, well, maybe, you know, variable sharing, so uh, subject matter overlap is not sufficient, but maybe together with something that we also like, which is truth preservation, we can just weed out the irrelevancies of truth preservation and, and we arrive just as, uh, at a nice system. Whether or not you like this motivation is quite orthogonal to the technical results. So perhaps you don't like this motivation, but perhaps the technical you know, tools that I present can give you some um, you know, useful things to do or to play with um, even outside of the scope of this paper. 
So basically, what I'm going for, I just said, is the fragment of classical logic that respects the variation in property here. Incidentally, this fragment also um, can be represented as uh, the first degree entailment fragment of a uh, relevant logic, which is um, which features the relevance at the level of the entailments, so the implications. And this is uh, the relevance logic, uh, which is called relatedness logic by Epstein. So, so perhaps some of you uh, are interested in logics where relevance is at the level of the implications. Uh, and here we'll be talking about systems where relevance is at the level of the entailments, right? So inference and not implications. Uh, so basically, the fragment of classical logic that respects the variable chain property is equal to the first degree entailment fragment of Epstein's relatedness logic. Okay, and perhaps it can also be, uh, you know, connected to other systems uh, in the relevance tradition. Good. So let me mention a few things about um, the variable chain property, right, and um, some logics in general. I'm going to talk about Tarskian logics and also about non-Tarskian logics. Um, so one good and interesting question could be, what if I have a Tarskian logic, just any Tarskian logic, um, what about the fragment of that logic that, that respects the variable chain property? Is that fragment itself a Tarskian logic or not? And if it's not, then what happens? So th there is some super easy answer to this, which is if the task and logic you already have at the beginning it satisfies the variable chain property, then restricting to a fragment that satisfies this property is just nothing. You're doing nothing. So you are ending with the task and logic again, right? But if the task and logic you are starting with, for example, in our case, classical logic is not a logic that satisfies the variable chain property, then the restriction of it or the fragment of it with, uh, which actually satisfies the variable chain property is not going to be a task and logic. It's actually going to be a non-transitive system and more particularly, it's going to be a non-transitive P logic. What is a P logic? Basically, a task and logic that doesn't satisfy transitivity. Satisfies reflectivity, satisfies um, uh, monotonicity and obviously contraction exchange, etc., 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 because everything is defined in terms of sets, okay, of uh, of premises and conclusions. In in this case, just single tones. But anyways, okay. So so then we can start asking about the satisfaction of the variable sharing properties in the semantic structures associated with task and logics, and also perhaps non-transitive P logics. So first of all, task and logics. We all know, and, and this is a very well-known result proved many times, perhaps in the literature, that task and logics can be associated with logical matrices, right? So basically, a uh, structure has an algebra and a set of designated elements, sometimes also called filters, etc. So qu question is, which conditions or logical matrices guarantee the satisfaction of the variable sharing principle in the logics induced by those matrices. And there is a very nice answer uh, to that, a sufficient answer anyway, uh, by, uh, by uh, Gemma Robles and Jesus Mendes, uh, which says basically something which is super, super clear and straightforward. So if we have a matrix which is induced by a logical matrix, right? We'll have an algebra and a set of designated elements, and we have the connectives negation, conjunction, disjunction. Um, and we have two elements in this algebra, which are such that A1 I, A1 and A2, such that A1 is designated and A2 is not designated. And A1 is a fixed point for negation, conjunction, and disjunction. And A2 is a fixed point for negation, conjunction, and disjunction. Then the logic induced by this matrix satisfies the variable sharing property or the variable sharing principle. And you can very easy, very easily see that because you have premises and conclusions and they do not share any propositional variable. You can assign A1 to all the proposition variables here and A2 to all the propositional variables here. Premise is going to be designated. Conclusion is going to be not designated. Therefore, you have what you ask for. Now, 
A very similar question can be posed, and I haven't seen this question posed in, in the literature, uh, although it's quite straightforward generalization of the previous one, which is, if you start with non-transitive P logics, how do you guarantee the satisfaction of the variable sharing principle? And the question is, are the two through the semantic structures, which are called uh, logical P matrices or, uh, or um, yeah, logical P matrices, right? Um, so basically, these are structures which generalize logic, regular logical matrices, and where you have two sets of designated elements, so to speak. Um, basically, these sets of elements uh, are such that you have a set of designated elements for, pre for premises and designated elements for conclusions. And the designated elements for premises um, are such that they are a subset of the set of designated elements for conclusions, right? Good. So which conditions on, on P matrices guarantee the satisfaction of the variable sharing uh, principle? Very straightforward application of generalization of the previous result allows to note that you need, if you have a, a logic induced by a P matrix of this form and you have these connectives, you basically need two elements, just as before, A1, A2, where A1 is designated for premises and therefore also for conclusions. And uh, what you have is that A1 is a fixed point for all operations, and A2 is not designated for conclusions, and also not designated for premises, where you also, uh, where also uh, A2 is a fixed point for all the operations, right? Good. So, so how are we going to use these sort of reflections um, to construct a semantics for the fragment of classical logic that respects the variable chain property? So we're going to do this in two steps. So the first step is actually the key to this, because we know that the restriction of, by, by this result, um, we know that the restriction of classical logic, the fragment of classical logic that respects the variable sharing property, is a non-transitive P logic. And we know that P logics are associated to P matrices. So the semantics for the fragment of classical logic that we're going for needs to be given in terms of P matrices, proper P matrices, matrices which are not regular logical matrices. So the question is how do we arrive at, at such structures? And the, 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 the process that I'm going for here is twofold. So first of all, we want to have a semantics for classical logic, which is not given in terms of logical matrices, um, like regular logical matrices, but actually P matrices. So we're going to give another semantics for classical logic, which is not the usual, you know, semantics in terms of Boolean algebras. Uh, and basically, a spoiler here, it's going to be a three value semantics, right? And the second step, but it's going to have the same valid inferences as classical logic. The second step will be to take that P matrix, which will have three elements, and extend this structure in terms of this result, which tells you that you need to have two elements, one of them designated for premises and conclusions, one of them not designated for premises and not designated for conclusions, um, such that they are fixed points for all operations. So basically, we first need a three element P matrix, and then we need uh, an, an element which also has two more values. So we're going to end up with a five element matrix that will let us do these things. But when we extend the, the, the three element matrix, we will need to do that in a very particular way, and I'm going to comment on that just, um, just shortly. So first of all, we need a proper P matrix for classical logic. Uh, so this will not be a matrix based on a Boolean algebra, uh, because you know semantics in terms of Boolean algebra for classical logics are actually logical matrices, right? And we need a proper P matrix, not a logical matrix, just a regular one. 
So what we are going to do here is to extend the Boolean algebra, the two element Boolean algebra, for example, with an additional element. In this case, it's going to be an infectious element. So like an absorbing element. And this will render what is usually called the weak cleaning algebra. And although this logic will have the same validities than classical logic, just for terminological purposes, I'm going to call it weak ST. Some of you may know this from the literature on semantic paradoxes. There are some logics which are called ST. This is a weak version of that. Doesn't really matter here, just a terminological thing. OK, so we arrive at the weak cleaning truth tables. And you can see that for true and false, this is just two element Boolean algebra. And then we have an infectious or absorbing or annihilating or however you want to see it element. And the question is, well, what, what does the P matrix look like in this case? So we have the weak cleaning algebra. Which are the set of elements that are designated for premises? And this is actually the same as in classical logic. So the premises need to be true. And the key trick here is that the set of designated elements for conclusions also includes this new element, T, the E, right? The, this infectious element. And how can you read that? So basically, what this says is that inferences in this system are valid if it's impossible for all the premises to be true and all the conclusions to be false, right? The trick here is that premises can be true, false, or this third option. So although you keep fixed the notion of logical consequence from classical logic, you throw in an additional truth value, um, which interestingly does not, you know, uh, wreak havoc in the set of um, valid inferences. So it's known and can be easily shown that the set of inferences induced by this pre matrix is exactly the set of inferences of classical logic, right? And here, and here I'm going to throw a, 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 an observation, which is that if you actually have any, any logic induced by a matrix whatsoever, and um, you have um, biological, a regular logical matrix that is whatsoever uh, can be uh, your favorite paraconsistent logic, uh, paracomplete logic, whatever you want. Um, you can actually do the same trick here. So basically, you add an infectious element and you add it that element to the set of designated uh, elements for conclusions. And the resulting logic will have the same valid inferences as the logic you had before. So this is a trick which can actually be generalized. It's not peculiar of classical logic. So the second step. So here we have just classical logic. It's nothing new, right? So, but it's a P matrix for classical logic. It's not a regular matrix. It's not a Boolean algebra and a filter on that, like an ultra filter or something like that on that algebra. It's a three element semantics. It's a three value semantics for, for classical logic. So the second step was to extend these structures along the lines of this lemma, which basically says you need to have some things which are designated for premises and conclusions, and some things which are not designated for premises, not designated for conclusions. OK? Good. So the extension that we're going to do here is needs to be very, very, very subtle. Why so? Because we're going to add two more elements. And one of them is going to be designated for premises and conclusions. The other one is going to be not designated for premises and conclusions. But we need to do this as seamlessly as possible. And what does that mean, technically speaking? So technically speaking, this means um, two things. So first of all, we need to add these two elements um, in a way in which they will first render all the inferences where premises and conclusions do not share a propositional variable invalid, right? So in the three element structure that we had before, that was not possible because all of the inferences of classical logic, even the ones which do not respect the variable sharing principle, were valid. 
So we, we, are, we are extending that structure in order to arrive at something which will do that. So we need to get rid of the irrelevances. But we also need to be super careful because we need uh, this addition of, of these uh, new values to not mess up the inferences where the variable sharing principle is actually satisfied. So we need this addition to actually only get rid of those you know, irrelevant inferences, and nothing more. Okay, so the way in which we do that is the following. We arrive at this matrix and, and just, just stay with me regardless of the crazy picture that these tables kind of uh, depict. So the idea here is that these two additional truth values will be such that whenever premises and conclusions do not share any propositional variable, it's possible to assign all the premises, one of these values, and all the conclusions, the other value, and then you have a valuation which invalidates the inferences. But if some of them, if, if premises and conclusions actually share some propositional variable, you have that these values will behave as if they were the other values, right? As if they were the intermediate third value that we had before. So we call these, um, these elements OE1 and OE2. The reason is going to be pretty clear uh, uh, right now, but basically we have a, a, a P matrix where we have these truth tables and the designated elements for premises are T and this new value. And the designated elements for conclusion are T, this new value, and the other third value that we had before. So why, why this terminology OE1, OE2, and how can this you know, behavior be algebraically sort of spelled out you know, in, a, in a more precise way? So the idea is the following. So this is just some terminology. You can call it however you want. But what I usually say is that an algebra has two elements. Let's call them K and OK, such that OK mimics K, if and only if for all the operations, basically, um, whenever you throw in OK, you can calculate the output of that operation as if you replaced OK by K, right? So basically, whenever you have this as an input, you have to just switch it for the other input. And this means that um, OK is mimicking K. And naturally, this can be generalized to algebra as something with a set of mimicking elements. And from here, actually, comes the terminology OE1 and OE2. So OE1 is an element which mimics E, and OE2 is another element which mimics E. And we can actually all also think about extensions of algebra with elements that mimic some previous elements, right? The only thing that we need to take into account is what happens where these values are all of the inputs. So I consider here the ex extending algebra uh, with mimicking elements, which are also universally unimportant, meaning that when they are all of the inputs, they are the output of the operation, OK? So basically, this is how you calculate operations in the extended algebra, right? So basically, you have mimicking case, and when, when it's all of the inputs, this is the output. So the result, the semantic result, is that these truth tables and these P matrix, so this algebra and this P matrix, actually are such that they characterize precisely the set of inferences in classical logic that respect the variable chain property, and therefore they characterize the first degree entailment fragment of uh, relatedness logic. Right? So, so, so basically, the formula to formula inferences in this, the logic induced by this P matrix, characterize this. If, you, if we take into account you know, multiple conclusions and multiple premises, things are different. But if we restrict to single premises and single conclusions, this is what we have. 
Um, and now for the final part, I would like to talk briefly about uh, the calculus for this system. So basically, I'm going to present a sequent calculus, a very easy sequent calculus, uh, where we have where we will have sequence of the form you know, phi, uh, phi 1 to phi n and psi 1 to psi n separated by commas. And these sequence will be interpreted as claims of the forms, the conjunction of all the things on the left on the left entails the disjunctions of all the things in the right, which uh, and, and, and implies, sorry, in the in related logic, uh, these things. Which is to say that the conjunctions of all the things on the left imply maintain sorry all the disjunctions of all the things on the right in the fragment of classical logic that respects the variable chain property. So basically, this conjunction entails this disjunction in classical logic, and also they share some propositional variable. So it's the, the sequence calculus is actually very 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 easy and straightforward and um, has a few rules and a few, let's call them linguistic restrictions to them. So initial sequence are forms of reflexivity for propositional va uh, variables, which have also left and right weakening of it. So we, we could make weakening explicit here, but it doesn't make any difference, right? So these are the axioms. Structural rules, we have only cut because a weakening is also here and contraction is assumed because they are sets. Um, and basically that's it. And, and so cut um, is only allowed, not in a general form, but in a restricted form, because otherwise we will, uh, if any of you remembers, for example, the Lewis proof of uh, X falso, um, you can have, you know, inferences. So the premises of, or, or the steps of, of that derivation of X falso all involve formulas uh, which respect the variable sharing property. So if you have tra uh, transitivity, you're going to prove X falso. But X falso is an inference where the premises and the conclusion do not share any propositional variable. So you cannot have unrestricted cut. You only can have a restricted version of cut, which is this. So it basically, if these things here happen, this at the bottom happens only if gamma and delta share some propositional variable. Right. We also have the usual disjunction and conjunction rules, um, but negation also needs to be taken care of. Why, basically, the same reason. So, you know, X falso and things of the like. So you only can move negations here and there if and only if that doesn't mess up the satisfaction of the variation uh, principle, right? Um, and the same here. We can go back to these if you want, but they are just straightforward explicitations of that requirement. So. Complete soundness is straightforward um, for these things. You can just prove that the sequence satisfies these and uh, by sharing uh, principle, and they are also valid in classical logic. Also, cut, also, everything here preserves uh, satisfaction, se uh, semantically speaking. And by induction on the length of the proof, you just prove that uh, calculus is sound. But the completeness proof has have some interest in it. Um, it essentially re uh, relies on applying uh, reduction trees. And what are reduction trees? Basically are um, trees where you have reduction rules and the rules are such that you start by a allegedly unprovable sequence and you apply the rules for the connectives in reverse um, and you at some point end up in an axiom or in an open branch and you can basically generate a counterexample out of the open branch, okay? And basically, you prove that all unprovable sequence have counterexamples to them. Um, so basically, for each unprovable sequence, uh, you have a counter model. But interestingly enough, um, for each thing which actually has a proof, 
the proof is cut free because the reduction rules, you have no reduction rules for cut. Um, and basically what you end up is that for the, for the um, sequence which are provable, you actually have cut free proofs of them. And this basically is all I have to say, I guess. Sorry, I went a little bit too fast, but if you have some you know, questions or anything, I will be more than happy to, to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Damian. Really nice talk. So now we have some time for questions, comments, in, in interaction. Uh, I would, as usual, I would like just ask you to first manifest in the chat, just to avoid a lot of people talking at the same time. But if you want to have make in question or comment, just say it. Valeria? Hey, Damian. Great talk. Thanks so much. Um, Thank you. Um, I, I have a question. Yeah. I, I want to know about, I mean, I was a bit late, so I'm sorry if it's, no it's something that already, but I want to know a little bit about the related related logic and why you kind of, in. I, I mean, I know you want to do things with classical logic, but I wonder why, um, well, I wonder why not dealing with implication in classical logic. I know that you can remove it and can think of it as, disjunction and, and and stuff but but i i would like to see what happens in in the in the implication case yeah yeah so so basically but but i mean one option could be to just focus on classical logic and not the inferences but the implications that respect these um that is a from from my understanding that is actually relatedness logic and the semantics for it are um, very interesting uh, but they are um, different from this case um, another thing could be also interest is to, to interesting is to, to to think about systems where, where you have um, you know the variation principle applying to both the entailment relation and the implication relation mm -hmm. um, I have no answer to that. I mean, that would be very interesting, deeply, but um, I have no idea how to go about that. So the methods do not apply? Is that what you're saying? Quite um, What I'm saying is, I mean, basically what I'm saying is I have my methods apply, but only if you think of implication as material implication. OK, thank if you. If you think that it shouldn't be defined and it is just an independent notion or something like that, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we'll have to see. All right. Super. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just grab a cup of water. I... <laughs> no, you are the next. Just wait for Damian to have his, his water. <laughs> I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Uh, Noah, you may talk. Hi. Okay. Hi, uh, first of all, thank you, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, that was quite interesting. Uh, I'm a bit of an outsider to non-classical logic. Uh, okay. Very quickly, do you have a good source to recommend on uh, the variable sharing property in, in just in general? Um, yeah, I mean, I would say that you, I mean, the usual like entailment, Anderson and Belknap, uh, that book, and of course, the Stanford Encyclopedia, like um, Relevance Logics as article in general, yeah. Okay. I need to go into them. Thanks. Good. Uh, Professor Epstein. Hi, this is Arf here, and thank you very much for the talk. I've got thank a couple you. questions. Um, yep. Are you familiar with paraconsistent relatedness logic? Uh, not really. Okay, well, that does exactly what you were describing uh, okay. with the uh, entailment. It converts uh, relatedness logic to have the additional condition for for consequence to uh, have well you would call variable sharing subject matter overlap and right. I think you might want to take a look at that that's in the 
third edition of Propositional Logics. It's also a paper. I can send you the reference. Nice. Thank now, I got a question. Okay. Yep. You talked about Queenie Eclini's weak tables. Yeah. I'm not familiar with those. I know his three valued logic. Yeah. And those tables are very different. Yeah. So where would I read about that? His weak tables. So basically in the um, 1952 book, uh, Introduction to Metamathematics, he has these two sort of systems. Uh, one, the, the most well-known is the so-called strong one, which is the, actually the, the sort of standard three value system that he presents. Um, and, but they are also called the strong truth tables. And then he also presents in that book um, the idea of the weak truth tables, which is the idea that, you know, where if you have any non-classical input, that sort of input infects the whole operation. So it screws the whole thing and any calculation which has a, a non-classical uh, component will lead you to a non-classical uh, result. That sounds much better. Well, I presented Pliny's strong version in the Propositional yeah. Logics book, but I yeah. like the weak version better. I don't know that one yeah. uh, because it it connects better with his interpretation of the third value as undecided or unknown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah. my question is, how do you interpret E and how yeah. do you interpret these other uh, yeah, no, no. new elements. What meaning yeah, I think that's a very good do, question, do they have? But, uh, I, I'm uh, sadly I don't have a very good answer to that very good question. Um, so um, this actually uh, traces back to 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 a different question, which is even even if you only start with, I mean, if you start with the three element thing, it has actually has a lot of interpretations. Uh, so recently, Shay Seville uh, mentioned something about off-topic. Uh, so th this this sort of element representing an off-topic uh, proposition, uh, whatever that means. Um, there are also the, the traditional interpretations in terms of um, the computate. There are computational interpretations in terms of critical errors in computing and processing. Also, the meaninglessness interpretation given by Russell and Goddard and Routley and some folks in Australia um, and so on and so forth. So the, for the tree value case, it's possible, but when you when you add these mimicking elements, what is really difficult is to interpret these mimic elements to give it to give an interpretation for this you know truth value which mimic sort of the weak value. But not quite. Uh, I don't have an answer to that, sadly. Uh, but I will be, you know, eager to to hear if anyone has one. I would suggest that until you do, yeah, it wouldn't be appropriate to call what you're doing giving semantics. Could be, could be, yeah, just a structure. Okay, good. Like algebras and such, yes. Yeah, algebras and such, absolutely, absolutely. Good, good. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? João? Hi, Damian. I don't know if the camera is working. Uh, that was a great talk. Thank you very much. Um, what I wanted to ask, um, you said you had no answer to it, but maybe you have thought about it. So <laughs> I may still ask, and I, and I also might give a, a suggestion of a of reading to Noah uh, right. in this. There's a, a very nice paper by Arnon Avron in 2014 at Annals of Pure and Applied Logic. You might know what is relevance logic. Okay. Uh, so he, he gives a, a, a definition which is for the set formula case, uh, not formula formula. And yeah. it it's based on extending the um, concept of uniformity. So it's, it's an abstract principle. It's not semantical or deductive. And it extends the idea, uh, the characterization of truth functional logics by uh, Schultz and Smiley, uh, in in uh, demanding demanding uh, some connection, and that when this connection doesn't exist, you might 
uh, in between the formulas, you might just delete uh, certain premises. Okay. Well, it's a well-known problem that no one knows how to extend this principle for the set set case. But uh, even if you want to do set formula, which you didn't, uh, you might want to uh, imagine um, that, I mean, everything goes fine with respect to uh, P entailment in that case, or, or the P matrices, uh, even if you don't have a conjunction around, because what you need is actually some kind of uh, meat that you can talk about in, in the meta language, right? So okay. have you have you actually tried uh, to make this extension of classical logic work, this, this version of classical logic work uh, for the set formula case, and why didn't it work? Yeah, excellent question. Um, so I'm going to give you a very slow answer so I don't make any you know, huge mistake. So basically, um, the, 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 I've tried it, and I think it is not possible to give a single P matrix for the set formula fragment of classical logic which respects the variable chain property. The reason, and I don't remember exactly now the counterexamples, I should have it here in some of my notebooks, but I don't remember exactly the counterexamples, but basically the reason is the following. There is a related problem, related, not exactly the same problem, which is given um, um, a, a Tarskian logic, is it possible to have a single matrix semantics for it? And it is known but I have only realized this literature very recently that um, these logics need to have, for the answer to be yes, for this task and logic, there is a single matrix semantics. They have to satisfy something called the cancellation property. And it's an abstract. Yeah, that's property. what I call uniformity. That's what Anon yes. calls uniformity. Yes, yes, yes. So basically, it's related to that. And you can show that for some task and logic, even though they have matrix semantics, they have so-called intersection of matrix semantics, right? They don't have a sing they don't have like a single matrix for them, right? Correct. Um, so what I think can be done, again, the modality here can be done, I haven't done it, um, is um, to prove something like the cancellation property, but for P logics, and to show that um, it's not possible so that the fragment, the set formula fragment of classical logic that respects the variable sharing property does not have that cancellation analog of, of uh, property. And so it cannot have like a single matrix. It can, it can have in the intersection of P matrices, but not a single one. I know if I answered uh, intelligently no, no. there. This is a great answer. Thank, thank you very much. I would oh, be thank willing you very to much for the question. offline if you want. This is uh, something I might have some ideas on. Thank you. Excellent. So, yeah, let's talk about it. Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments? No? So, thank you very much again. Thank you very much. Really nice talk. Thank you very much, Bruno.